I'll let you start. I think everyone knows what we're covering tonight, the G1000 program. Yeah, this this slide. Just make sure you're in the right virtual room. Okay, so thanks everybody for attending. I will try to keep this in an hour and a half, but uh, we'll, you know, there's a lot of material to cover. Of course, that said, we're not going to cover everything about the G1000. There's a lot to cover, and uh, if we do cover everything, uh, you, you won't remember like nine out of ten. So we'll cover the important things, and uh, this will of course make more sense if you've touched the G1000, but uh, even if not, hopefully uh, this will make some sense. And I do have the uh, the trainer from Carmen, the PC trainer uh, that I'm going to use for live demos sort of in between the two slide decks. Uh, there are two modules. This is num number one. One is basically everything except the autopilot and the flood director, and then two is the autopilot and flood director. So we're going to start with one and then do a little bit of live demo, take, take a little shoot, break, and then move on to module two. Uh, okay, all right, so and these are uh, CAPS uh, transition slides, so the part of uh, the training towards the Form 5, if you're looking for that. I think Garmin has another slide deck, and I, I think it has better visuals, but anyway, there's a lot of material for the G1000 out there. There are books, there are videos, there's YouTube, there's flash trainers, there's, there's a lot of material that's going to save you time and money so that you fly less. Um, all right, so... Module one is basically what we said. We're going to talk about the PFD, MFD. Oh, yeah. And uh, if you have questions, please speak up. So when I'm done with the slide, I cannot monitor the chat because I'm sharing the screen right now. So if you do ask a question at the chat, uh, somebody's going to have to read out for me. In recording started. Beautiful. All right. So this is um, when. If you're a pilot who hasn't flown uh, a G1000 before, or say maybe you're used to round dials, sort of like the old style navigations, now we start talking about how your situational awareness, how those skills adapt in an airplane that is more automated, gives you more information, it's more uh, uh, in integrated, it, the, the computer is basically more integrated with the flight instruments. And, of course, there's some new terms coming to play, that like automation management and the levels of automation. So this is some of the stuff we're going to cover. And, of course, risk management comes into play as well. Like, um, it is a G1000 aircraft, like we have G1182s in Group 2, but they're still airplanes. That doesn't mean that they can do something that, that you couldn't before. Uh, maybe you're more comfortable in G1000, maybe not. It doesn't mean that... The G1000 will get you out of any situation. You also have to be honest about your proficiency in the G1000. What was the last time I flown G1000? Has it been a while? Yeah, well, do I really want to fly it at night flight for an actual mission if I haven't flown the G1000 in six months? So we have to take all the additional considerations that come with the G1000 in mind. Um, um, yeah, so stuff we're going to be talking about as well. So. A lot of what I hope you'll get out of this is not necessarily to remember things, that's useful of course, but that will come with practice. It's about the logic between the G1000, how you can find something, how you know where things are, how you know how to look for things, and uh, how you know what the system capabilities are. And also, of course, how they have help you with your situational awareness. At a very basic high level, the G1000 is two screens. In our 182s, in larger planes, it can be more. But in our, in our 182s, we have two screens. We have the primary flight display that we're going to call the PFD. Don't call it PDF. It's an entirely different thing. It's a PFD on the left. And then the MFD, the multifunction dif display, that's on the right side. Uh, briefly, the PFD is your six-pack, plus a lot more. But in any case, it's, it's your six-pack. You see here, as, as we'll go step by step, you have the basic flight instruments. You also have an HSI, so you, it also gives you navigation. It gives you a small map, and you can control both radios and both VORs. And it also gives you some course guidance. You also get the flight director, so we'll talk about it with the autopilot. That's the PFT. The MFT is more closely to, like, if you're used to flying a... a round dial plane with a GPS, like a 430 or an Avodine or something, that's closer to what the MFT is. It gives you the map, it gives you weather, you can do flight planning more easily on the MFT, you can get system settings, get the status of GPS, you can still control the COM and the NAV, and it gives you your engine indicators, as you can see here. 
So, when it comes to, I think there's more, yeah, so the G1000 components, we talk about the screens, but there's a lot, a lot behind that that we're going to talk about. Briefly, there's a transponder, just like any other plane, it's just that it's remotely controlled. That's why there's, you won't see it sticking out at, at the panel, but you're going to set the transporter code through the G1000. And uh, there's two new units. Basically, there's the air hars, uh, which is yeah, attitude heading and reference system. The, the acronym is defined here. And then there's the air data computer, ADC. You can think of air hars, like if you think of the six pack, anything that used to have a gyro is now controlled by the air hars. That means your attitude, your turn coordinator, and uh, well, I guess not not your heading indicator. That's a magnetometer, but I think it's uh, that's also part of it. Yeah, and then the air data computer is anything that's static port or pitot tube, so altitude, airspeed, and VSI. Okay, and then there's the magnetometer that senses your heading, and of course there's the transport. Yeah, so back to map we have the ATC, we have air hires, we have the magnetometer. And then we have engine monitoring systems. We have a data link for ADSB. Um, we used to have XM. I guess we still have it, but um, we don't have this solution anymore. We have the autopilot. We have the servers for the autopilot. But these are the basic systems. Now, what what we're showing here is like a, it's a pamphlet from Garmin, and there is a difference with our CAP planes. This unit in the middle here is that's the audio panel. A standard G1000 setup has only one audio panel. Our CAP planes have two audio panels, one for the left seat and one for basically everybody else. And that sort of helps so you can have like the MO talk to COM3 while the pilots talking to COM2 and they're entirely independent. It's a really handy thing. It's just that that's the difference that you see in our planes. We have two audio panels. You can stop it any time with questions, but yeah. So when you do go and pre-fly the plane, there's a checklist. Of course, we follow the checklist for the pre-flight. Uh, you'll notice one of the differences there with pre-flighting a G1000 plane with a round dial is that there's more to do inside the cockpit, cockpit before going out. Uh, part of that process is you're going to power up the system and, and you, you're going to check the uh, PFD. And you're going to check that some enunciators are there. You're going to check that there's no excess and that kind of thing. So basically, you follow the checklist. When only the PFT on, you'll see the engine indicators on the PFT, but normally when we're flying, we have both screens on, of course, and the engine instruments are the MFT. So, right. we're not going to go through the checklist. Basically, the point of the checklist, and how, not just for the pre-flight, but also how to start up when you're ready to start the engine after that, just follow the checklist. You'll get familiar, you'll study that before your flight. And but but you'll notice that this, all the different components are sort of starting up at different times. So you're going to check the standby battery. You're going to see initially red excess at the PFD, meaning uh, that the air hires or the ADC are not giving information. That's because they're still booting, and they're going to complete their booting, and and you're going to see all this information uh, displayed. And, and the attitude indicator has sort of this alignment process has to go through. So there's a boot up sequence. Follow, follow the checklist for that. Um, the point is not to memorize any of what's on this slide, but as long as you get the the uh, the gist of what we're talking about here. And then this leads to an important concept. It, it's labeled here system startup because you do see that a system startup, but uh, this is the first time I'm going to say it again because it's important. The G1000 has annunciators. Annunciators are messages. The message is to draw your attention into something, something that's important for the flight. And it has, I, it has three levels. It has advisories, which is just in white, and they're just informational, like storm, storm scope has failed. That's one of them. It has cautions. I'm using the words carefully here because that, that's how the reference manual uses them. So cautions are in yellow, and they're stuff you'd want to know, but they're not of immediate threat to the flight like low vacuum from the vacuum pump is one example. 
and it has warnings that are in red and they are something that really should draw your attention right away. So like, for example, low oil pressure or low volts, that refers to the voltage of the main bus. And you'll see them on the bottom right on, on the PFD. Cautions and warnings will also make a sound. And that's partly what you're looking for in the pre-flight. Right, I'm, I'm, I'm pausing for questions, not for dramatic effect. But. Right, so the engine instruments normally they're on the MFD. They could be on the PFD at startup or if the MFD fails, there's I think towards the end of the slide that we talk about that, but the engine systems basically have three sub pages. This is the default one. Shows you the, your manifold pressure gauge, your RPM, your fuel flow, really useful instruments. Uh, all pressure, all temperature, your uh, the CHT of the hottest cylinder, it even tells you which cylinder that is. So right now it's showing you the CHT, that cylinder head temperature of cylinder one, and you can see little, little one at the indicator here. Uh, EGT, also the hottest one. Fuel quantity, left and right. And electro system. So the electro system, you get volts and amps from the from the standby battery and the main battery. And I mean, the main bus and the uh, and the essential bus. Now, this is leads to one of the big differences. We have two batteries on board. We have the main and the essential one uh, that we're gonna talk about more in detail later, but have that in mind, there's two batteries on board. All right, PFT, these are the basic components and this slide here tries to map the six pack that you're used to into where it appears on the PFT. So the big thing in the center is your attitude indicator. It's nice and big, easily readable, pretty detailed. Then you have your airspeed and it's a tape. It's not a, it doesn't rotate, it's not, it's not a circle like the steam gauges airspeed. It's a tape, moves up or down depending. It has labels, notice that it gives you VY, V glide. These are pre-configured in the system. Normally we have them, for example, the best glide speed is for maximum weight. It doesn't mean it's appropriate for your flight at that particular time, but these are user adjustable labels. Uh, the rate of turn, actually, I'm sorry, the ball, so basically your, your turn coordination is this trapezoid. So here we're perfectly uh, coordinated. If we weren't, it would, this trapezoid that's underneath this triangle pointing up, that would be on either side. And just like you step on the ball here, you step on the trapezoid if it's to the left. And also this, these two triangles here show you your bunk. Now, I think we have some people on the line who have taken this before and know the G1000 and also don't want you to fall asleep. So what is your rate of turn indicator? Question. Okay, maybe I should have asked you earlier. Maybe. Yeah, is, isn't it the uh, on the compass, top of the compass? It'll show you your rate of turn. Yeah, with an arrow. exactly. Yeah, so you don't see it here. Uh, the G1000 has what it's called, what it calls trend bars, uh, which you don't see it here because it's a static slide. Remind me, remind me to show you that in the simulator. Basically, anything that changes, like the altitude or the heading, it gives you a little magenta, oops, a little magenta arrow that shows which way it's changing, and also it shows you where it's going to be in six seconds. And that's how you can define a standard rate. I think there's a slide for that that, that gives you the visual cue. So hold on to that term. But it's basically your the rate of turn. You can deduce that by the rate of change, uh, the trend bar. I'm sorry, the trend bar that is displayed on your on your compass. Right, and then we have the altimeter. This is the VSI, currently it's showing zero. That's why there's no number. And also the G1000 has some user selectable fields. And there is logic to the colors. So we're gonna get into that later, but for this, it's pretty easy to see. Like the, this is the altitude select. We also call it the altitude bug. This is the entirely pilot selectable, user selectable. It has a function for the flight director, but 
it, you can also use it as a reminder. It's uh, light blue, that indicates that it's user selectable. Another thing that's user selectable and therefore light blue is the heading in, uh, bug. Also has a function with the flight director. Right now the heading bug is pointing where we're pointing. All right. And there's this other stuff around. So there's the transponder here, the code, the mode it's on. There's a clock. It does know the time. It does tell the time. Uh, outside air temperature, navigation frequencies, and COM frequencies. And the way they're formatted, you see there's COM1, COM2, NAV1, and NAV2. The standbys for both COM and NAV are on the, to, towards the outside of the screen. The actives are towards the inside. And you have the waypoint status bar. That um, that's basically your flight plan. It's basically your next waypoint in the flight plan if you, or if you're going direct. Tells you which waypoint, distance, desired track, and your current track. That's that's configurable. So in some places you might see like a the bearing being uh, being displayed. Okay, so the screens, both the PFD and the MFD, as pieces of hardware, they're identical. They have the same buttons. So you can do almost anything um, from both screens, and it doesn't really matter. So what SESTA likes to recommend, and, it's, and I think it's a good idea, it's, but it's just a technique, there's no rule about it, is the left hand is for the yoke, and it stays on the yoke. Your right hand is what pushes all the buttons. And because of the of the placement, so these here, basically the left side of the PFD and the, uh, I'm sorry, the right side of the PFD and the left side of the MFD are towards the center of, of the panel. So they're more appropriate for your right hand. So this is what you normally will be using. The audio paddle is also there, that's convenient. Okay. and. Now we're starting to more into the controls. Again, don't feel bad if you, if you forget a lot of these things, you'll do them in practice. Now that said, if you're familiar with Garmin products in general, like a Garmin radio or a Garmin GPS, that not the touch screens one so much, but like a Garmin 400, 500, a lot of the logic is the same. It's surprisingly the same. So when it comes to COM, it gives you a volume knob, it gives you the flip-flop switch to make, to make a standby frequency active, and it gives you the knob to tune the frequencies. Uh, the standard knob in this hardware is, has two basic knobs. It's the big knob that's always the inside and the, and the small knob. Big knob changes numbers, um, I mean digits, and the uh, small knob changes decimals. Then you have some other stuff. So you, you have this control that you use uh, to set the barometric setting for the altimeter. You also use it to set this, the, the OBS, like if you have the GPS and OBS mode, or if you're flying a VOR, you use to set this, what we call the CRS. Basically, if, if you remember the old VORs, you, you set the OBS setting. It's the same thing. Then you have a little range button and joystick because you can get a cursor on the map and move it around to get more information. And then you get these six buttons that should be familiar to anybody who's flown a Garmin GPS. You have the direct button, menu that gives you a menu depending on what page you're at, flight plan, the flight plan, uh, procedure that's for IFR, clear if you want to delete something and enter if you want to register something. And then you have another knob here at the very bottom that you can use to type or to switch through pages and chapters. I think that's the same thing. Yeah, so these, these are basically the keys that we just talked about. Uh, All right, and then the FMS knob is something you'll be using a lot. As I said, it's something that, that you type, and you type sort of the Garmin way, where the big knob moves the cursor, the small knob changes the letter, and it just makes you wish, you know, you had a keyboard. But we have to enter, like, complicated flight plans through that little knob and hope that knob doesn't break. But it you'll be using it a lot. And now this knob also has a button. You can push it, and that's how you get a cursor or you erase a cursor. 
going to go more into that later. And on the other side, now this slide is, there are different flavors of the G1000. This slide, the, the place that we have in, in group two have an integrated flight director and autopilot. So on the left side of the screens, they have more buttons that have to do with the autopilot. We'll talk about those later. But for this slide, it assumes G1000 without an autopilot and flight director, therefore it has a big gap here. But it still has all the other buttons. So for VORs, you get a volume, a flip-flop, and a, a, a tune, a frequency selector knob, same thing. You get a knob to change the heading bug, and you get a knob to change the altitude bug. Those are on the left side of both screens, PFD and MFD. How are we doing so far? Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay, so can anybody tell me why soft keys are called soft keys? What's soft about them? They have more than one function. They can change their meaning. Exactly. To open up different uh, fields. Exactly. I think you all got it. Uh, the function of those keys depends on the on on the current menu on the current menu level. And it's different between the PFD and the MFT. They do different things. On the PFD, what happens, so the example here is called the PFD and it's showing you the standard um, sort of menus. You'll notice that there's the soft keys. The keys themselves, they don't have anything printed on them that tells what they do. This bar here that says insert PFD, all that, that's part of the screen. And that's why these labels change if the function of these buttons change. So that, that's the label. So another uh, way of uh, thinking of it is that uh, the function of the keys is determined by the current state of the software. Yeah, I think that's where the soft comes in. Okay, yeah, good point. All right, so this is the default sort of menu for the PFD. You see you have a transporter key, a, a CDI, OBS, PFD. If you press one of these, they will lead you to another menu. Um, I wonder if it's worth demonstrating now because you will forget by the time. So just give me a sec. I have the I have the trainer here. Uh, if for those who, who don't know what I'm talking about, this is you can buy this from Garmin. And of course, there are equivalents for like an iPad or so on. Uh, but this is uh, the Windows software and it gives you it's a little simulator. It's not official, but it's it does most things well. And so I've set it to be a PFD. So you see here the soft keys. My transponder right now is a 1200, nice and VFR. If I want to change my transponder code, that's done by soft keys. So I have to press transponder. And now because I did that, I go into a different menu of the soft keys and now the functions of the soft keys change. So now I select code, I type in my code and it takes me back to the main menu and it changed my code. All right, also notice how the altitude bar here changes. I can change it from here. I said, there we go. Yeah, clicking is actually not easy on these things, but it does work eventually. Um, and so on, all right. We'll come back more to that later. Where is it? There we are. Okay, so this is soft keys, and there's a whole bunch. Again, you're not going to remember everything, but it's worth noting that what, what it means here by inset, that's a little map. It's a mini map that you get in the PFT, and it helps you have a little map, even though, the, for example, the mission observer is busy doing stuff on the, on the MFT. And when you press the inset button, it takes you to another menu that has to do with choices about that inset. So you can basically control the overlays in, in this case. Storm scope, terrain, topographical, lightning, and so on. And there's also what is called this thing called declutter. So there are different declutter levels to basically reduce the information shown because you know it's a small map and it can be busy. And there's also soft key that says PF, PFD that affects, for example, the the style of your uh, HSI. It can also affect uh, what sort of um, extra readouts for distance that you might get on the, um, where am I? That was actually shown, yeah. So see these things that say nav one, 
Nav2. These are distance readings from from waypoints, either VORs or something on your flight plan. And you can enable these or change these by the PFT soft key. That's what I was getting at. And there's more. Um, you, I don't want to go into everything here. Like it, each of these has a function. You should play around with it, especially at the simulator. And I do want to talk about the OBS mode because that's sort of important. It's the same thing as the Garmin 400, 500. That, so the OBS mode hasn't changed in like 30 or 40 years or even before that. I, I actually don't remember what the 250 does. But what the OBS mode does really high level is it makes the next waypoint, the next GPS waypoint into a VOR, a virtual VOR. So now you can get a radial from that waypoint and you can use it to sort of track a certain uh, ground track to or from that radio. And that's what's called OBS mode. It also suspends sequencing of waypoints. All right, and you see this little DME soft key. Let me ask you, the planes that we have in group two, the G1182, actually all, all the G1000, do they have a DME? It's okay. Just, just what's your best? Do our planes have a? Do our G1000 planes have a DME? I would say no. Does anybody else say no? No. I'll say right. yes. Ah, okay. I'll so. say maybe. Okay, folks, come on. We have to take a position here. Now we now we're totally split. Who will be the tiebreaker? It absolutely does have a DME. Ah, all right. Unfortunately, they do not. So our planes do not have a VHF DME. They do give you distance information, and they can be entirely equivalent to a DME, but they're GPS derived. Not slant range. Yeah, they don't have slant range. That's exactly. But we have GPS derived DME, which according to the aim, is a legal substitute for IFR as well. But we don't have a VHF DME. Now, if you have a G1000 outside of CP that has a VHF DME, that's perfectly fine. You can also find a G1000 with an ADF. It's really hard to find, but it's possible. If it's derived so, from those other sources, will it, it'll have different colors or something, right? Uh, yeah, you know, I've never fl actually flown a VHF DME, but you're right, it should. Uh, although, actually, I'm not sure about that. So it's going to show here, you see these little insets? It's going to show here. I, I'm not sure about the color. That's a good question. So, uh, George, if I have a, a, an IFR approach, say localizer DME, then uh, I would use the GPS uh, distance. You use whatever the approach asks you to do. Um, so that's going into the IFR part of things, which is not really the focus for tonight, but there is a gotcha. So, for example, if you want to fly the ILS to it right at Oakland, that approach has you use a DME that is from Oakland VOR, even though you're flying a localizer. Okay. So you have to you have to set it up right that you get an inset here showing your distance to the Oakland VOR, say by putting the VOR in NAV2, but you're flying the localizer in NAV1. Got it. And what, what if, uh, if the approach doesn't have a, 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 only has a DME? Then I wouldn't be able to use, is that right? What do you mean only has a DME? Uh, like in other words, uh, what, what, what if uh, uh, it's not a, like in Oakland where you use the VOR uh, for DME? What if it has a different channel uh, specifically for the DME? I wouldn't be able to use it here, right? So would I use the GPS dis uh, GPS distance or since? Yeah, you can always use the GPS distance, but I, I'm trying to remember of a DME station that is just by itself and is not attached to anything, either a localizer or a VOR. Uh, I can't remember one right now. I guess it's possible, though, but I just can't remember that right now. I, but in that case, so if if you have that case happen, I'm not entirely sure, but I think you can still tune the frequency on, for example, NAV2. You won't get any course guidance, 
but if it's in the database, it might work out. Okay. I think that's the key. It's GPS derived, so it needs to be in, in the database. The the only reason you're tuning in the frequency for nav one and nav two is to tell it what should, it should be measuring the distance to and from. Now, of course, you, you can like the approach also has waypoints, so it, and those point, waypoints will be in the flight plan, so you might not even have to do that. In fact, in like the Oakland approach, you don't have to do that. You can just use the waypoints of the approach, but it's just a nice backup to have the DME distance. Right, that was an IFRD tour, but anyway. All right, and going back into Carlos' mother. Um, the colors behind the G1000, there's logic behind them. Anything that's GPS derived is magenta. Anything that's VHF or ground derived, I guess, is green. So this is how the HSI looks like if it's if the course kindness comes from GPS. VOR1 is in the middle. It's green, but it only has one line, and VOR2 is two lines. So that's how you can easily tell if you, if it's tuned to VOR or VOR2. Of course, it also tells you VOR and VOR2, but just it's a nice visual indicator because it's kind of important to know what you're flying towards. And the CDI soft key is what cycles through all these three options. Does that, can anybody tell me what those light blue needles are? I believe that's the ADF. Isn't that the VOR? No, I'm, I'm sorry. That's Is it a, a magnetic based. A turn. Uh, it shows the direction of a uh, of a v, uh, VHF signal, but not uh, not necessarily. A, it differentiates between that and the course bearings that you set up. It uh, it shows the <clears throat> the uh, the uh, VOR that you aren't actively tuned to with the CDI. So <clears throat> in the middle one, we're obviously using VOR one. That's why the needle's green, and therefore VOR two is in the background in blue there. Because yeah. you can't yeah. use you can't use them both at the same time in CDI. If if you notice, RMI1 is also there. It's behind the green. But I think you've got it. Like, I think all, all, all answers were, were pretty much on. This, these are called the RMI needles. And they are pointing to the NAV1 is the single line, and NAV2 is the double line. And, and they just point directly to those stations. So you don't tune the OBS setting or the CRS, as it's called. You, they just point you directly towards them. So it's nice to to use them to cross check, like if if you're going to use a cross radial to define a waypoint, they're very useful, or as a backup. And remember, I said that they point towards. So in this case, for example, VOR two nav two, the, the heading that you would fly to get to it would be two six zero. But if you look at the other side of the needle, that tells you the radial that that you are from it. So in this case, you're on radial zero eight zero. Hey George. Yes. And you would uh, you would enable those or bring those up using the the bearing one and bearing two soft keys, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, so 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 you would hit the PFD soft key here, and uh, and they would appear. It's bearing one and bearing two, exactly. Say on uh, earlier in the demonstration, you said that um, if you establish a waypoint, that it can actually show you as a BOR on your screen. So are those VORs that we're looking at, are those real VOR stations or are those uh, also perhaps waypoints? So these are these are my needles are derived from VORs. Uh, so real the, VORs or waypoint? Yeah, yeah real VORs. And so w when it comes to VOR, VOR, I'm sorry, VOR1 and VOR2, basically NAV1 and NAV2, those are always VHF. So they're real VORs. Not, not to be confused with the OBS mode. These are my needles have to do with NAV1 and NAV2, and those are VORs. Now, there is a way, okay, I should, here, let me show you. Because I think there is a way to have a, a, a bearing needle. To a GPS derived VOR. I just, I, I've never had to do it, so I don't know. So you should be looking at the PFD. 
let's go direct to somewhere. How about we go to whatever pops up first? Keflavik, that sounds like it's in Russia. So enter, oh, it's in Iceland and Russia and Pakistan. Okay, let's go to Iceland. All right, so not, now we're going direct to that waypoint. It's 2,888 miles, so be patient. But this is pointing you directly to where it, it we would have to fly. Now, I can change my CDI needle and now look at its VOR1. This frequency is not in tune, so that's why I'm not getting a needle. It's actually not picking up anything, but I can go to uh, the PFT soft key and I can go bearing one. Now, the RMI needle for that nav1 uh, would be to nav1, but it says no data because it's not picking up a VHF needle, uh, signal. But I can also press it again, and now it's giving me an RFMI needle to the GPS waypoint. George, you have a question? Yeah. Um, I up? think it's from Eric Bless. Edward Bless. Uh, no, I, I, uh, he just answered my question, so I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so it it's configurable. I didn't mean to. Yeah, I should have um, had maybe a little different wording there. But what what I said that these are my needles are pointing into nav one, nav two. That's usually how we fly them because usually the CDI is on GPS anyway. But absolutely, that's not necessarily the case. You can fly VOR on CDI and have the are my needles pointing to, to the GPS. Okay, other soft keys, the transponder that I showed you, and then ident, also transponder, see if you press ident, it's gonna show you ident to visually show you that it's identing. Uh, there is a timer, you can use it for approaches, it's there. You can also change the reference speeds. P please don't unless you have a really good reason, but you, you can, they're here. And uh, nearest. If you want to find your nearest airports in a hurry, that's a soft key for that. It will tell you the bearing, distance, frequencies, Unicom and so on, runway length, and available approach types. Really useful tool. Okay, going back to our colors. Colors do matter. Cyan or light blue is pilot adjustable. Green is VHF, ground derived and active items, magenta is GPS. And advisory or alert are white. These are sort of the lower priority messages. Yellow are the cautions, and red are the highest priority, and those are warnings. All right, and then from the audio panel, remember if you're on the left seat, you play with the audio panel that's towards the middle of the panel. And then if you're on the right seat, you play for the right seat or audio panel. We have three comms COM1. Com2, those are VHF, controlled by the DME, I mean, by the G1000. And Com3 is our cup radio. And then you have some other buttons. Some of them don't particularly work because of, of the configuration. But AUX is the Becker. I don't think our planes have an ADF, but they do have NAV1 and NAV2, so you can listen to the Morse code of the VORs. I uh, don't remember if you have a DME button there, but it doesn't do anything. Um, the play button, unfortunately, doesn't work. So normally the G1000s can replay the last, I don't know, so many seconds that came in from the radio, but that is disabled for us because we have two audio panels. And then we have the isolation buttons. Those are fun. Um, can anybody tell me what those do? Yeah, they let you uh, control the internet. So. <clears throat> There's three modes. It's either, uh, you know, everyone talking when ne neither are put enabled. Uh, you can isolate the pilot from the rest of the passengers and the co-pilot. Uh, you can isolate the co-pilot from the pilot and the rest of the passengers. Or if you hit both, then you isolate the crew, the pilot and the co-pilot from the passengers. That's exactly right. So if you're the pilot and the crew is speaking and it's important uh, and ATC wants to talk to you so you don't want to hear everything you can isolate yourself the key is to remove the isolation when you're done otherwise the crew is talking to you and you're not responding 
that has happened to me more times than I can remember right now. And yeah, when you're done, like if you don't want to be isolated anymore, just press that button again. I think that's stuff we talked about. And yes, of course, that's also so. When it comes to COM1, COM2, COM3, there are two options. You can monitor one, two, or three, one or all of those, but you can only speak to one. So if you want to talk to, in this case, COM1, you press COM1 mic, and there's a little light top of COM1 mic that lights up to remind you that you're talking to COM1. And there are lights on COM1, COM2, COM3 on the right side. That's the monitoring. That's what you're listening to. In this case, we're listening on COM1 and COM2. We're only talking to COM1, though, and we're not listening to COM3. Right, this is how you change, just like any radio, that knob is, uh, as I said, the big knob changes the numbers, the small knob changes the decimals, the flip-flop switch makes it active. Notice how they relate, though. Actually, I'll just... Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a little demo a little later. But in this case, we're talking to COM1. The active frequency for COM1 is on the inside of the screen. That's why this frequency is green. It's telling you that frequency is what you're talking to. And if we were to press the flip-flop switch, COM1 would switch down by an active frequency. We know that we're editing COM1 because you see this rectangle, the sign rectangle. That's sort of like your cursor. That tells you what frequency you're editing. If I were to twist these knobs, it's this frequency that's going to change. If I were to press the flip-flop, it's COM1 that's going to flip its frequencies. Okay. All right. So as we said, we have two audio panels. Uh, there is an automatic squelch also. Uh, sometimes I have to yell to break squelch. So there is a manual squelch button that you can press as well. And if you do that, you see this little knob here. That that can is used as squelch or volume, depending on if you're on minus squelch or not. And when I say volume, I mean volume of the intercom. The volume for radios is controlled by this little knob up here. So usually what we do is we have the left seat pilot transmitting on a VHF frequency, COM2 transmitting on, I mean, uh, the, the right seat transmitting on COM3, that's CAP radio. It's possible for the right seat to transmit on COM2, so both are talking to a VHF frequency. Of course, be careful with I interference, but it's possible. So this is CAP FM radio, Co uh, so COM1 and 2, that was, that's a split mode. Uh, that's disabled for us. Becker, play, as I said, is disabled and so on. This red button here, um, is used to enter what is called reversionary mode, which means the PFT is moved to the MFT. Say that your PFT, your, the actual screen, the hardware, breaks down. The screen doesn't show anymore. You press that red button, and now your PFT it moves to the MFT. You still have all your flight instruments or flight data in there. The only downside is that you have to look a little to the right. Okay, so this, <laughs> these buttons here have caused... Uh, some squawk sometimes can can anybody tell me what the seat select button does so I turn the back seat uh, microphone jack on and off yeah it's not the jack is the push talk button uh but you're right so basically what happens is normally these systems they have two push to talk buttons, left seat and right seat at the front. But CAP, we have a push to talk button on the back seat as well. There are cases where we want the scanner to talk on the radio, but the system doesn't support three push to talks. So there's the switch, it's what the one we're talking about here, that basically selects, do you want the observer push to talk to be active or the scanner push to talk to be active? You can only have one of the two. And there's a little light here that says which of the two. So right now it's showing, it's highlighting two, that means the uh, observers push to talk is active. You, if you press it, it will say three. That's the back seat. If you're the observer and your push to talk doesn't work, check that switch. It's more often, a lot of the times, that's the cause. And the other button to the right, 
uh, it selects what COM3 is. In our planes, it should always be, as shown here, FM, because we don't have an alternative choice. If you press that and select the, the UHF radio, which we don't have, you basically disable COM3. So check those buttons. They're sort of on, on the lower side. You see the, the flap control there to the left of the flap control. All right, the MFT. What I want you to remember about the MFT, just like the older garments, same idea, is the, the information is presented in pages, and pages are organized in chapters. So there's a bunch of chapters, and each chapter has um, a theme. So it can be navigation or it could be maps. And each side, each chapter, there are a bunch of pages. What we're showing you here is the default. That's the nav navigation map. But the navigation map is a page that belongs to the map chapter. So the, the chapter on the page is shown here. We are currently at the map chapter at the navigation map page that belongs to that chapter. And you can see on the bottom right here, the other chapters that you can have the, that are available to us. I think this is a good place for a little demo because I think a, a lot of what the slides are showing us, which we'll go through, can be demonstrated. So if you have the Garmin PC Trainer, you can actually change whether you're looking at the PFT or MFT by clicking PFT mode. There's a way to, to have them both if you have a large screen, but anyway. So right now, map chapter, navigation map page. If I want to change, I use my FMS knob. If I want to change the page, I use the small knob. If I want to change the chapter, I use the big knob. So I, if I twist the small knob in this case, you see here it pops a menu. This is the traffic map, still the same chapter. This is the storm scope. This is the weather data link, XM. In our planes, the actual choices are different because, uh, well, we have different equipment, and, uh, but this is really zoomed out. You can see states, but anyway, and TAWS, which we don't have, that, that that's for terrain. Now, but and if I want to change chapters, I twist the big knob, and now I go into the waypoint chapter, which has airport information, VOR information, a lot of good stuff. We go to the auxiliary status of the system, system setup, some configuration options, some trip planning information. Then we go to flight planning, which is the active flight plan, which you're going to spend a lot of time on this page. But flight planning and then also flight plan catalog, so you can save a flight plan. And then there's a checklist. Yes, there is a checklist in the G1000, and everything is just not convenient to use. So I've never seen anybody use it, but all the stuff is here. And then, oh, I forgot that. And then there's a nearest chapter. And there's a page for nearest airport, nearest VORs, nearest waypoint, and so on. So if somebody asks you, hey, which is the nearest VOR, just so we have a backup? Well, go to the nearest chapter, nearest VOR page. This is a list sorted by distance. That's your nearest VOR. Now, engine in indicator systems. So you have as I said, there's, there are three pages. We only showed you one so far, the default one. But if you press the engine soft key, now you have access to the other two. So if we press lean, now you get EGT and CHT for each of the six cylinders. If you're flying the 172, it's four cylinders. And if you go to system, you get the tack time. This is a brand new plane. It has only four hours, 0.4 hours tack. But this is where your tag time will show up because you need to put in the logs. It's also the only place where you get your va vacuum indication. Okay, all right. Moving back to the slides makes stuff we talked about. This is the organization for the MFT. Again, chapters and pages. It is a little different from, you know, plane to plane, but uh, this might be for our planes. Well, there's no flight plan chapter here. Anyway, so just just remember the logic behind this and, and the, the things you see here are, are almost exactly right, but I think we're just missing the flight plan chapter. 
So the flight plan button that we saw, that's a hard wired button on the uh, right side of the MFT of the PFT, that's basically a shortcut to take you to the flight plan chapter active flight plan page. But you can also go to the page through knob twisting. And in whatever page you have, the menu button will give you different things. So if you're in the navigation map, page it will show you like zoom level or map pointer or uh, how you want to configure what you're looking at or the terrain how that shows up and so on or do you want a fuel range ring and so on all good stuff now don't you know for consistency sake don't change stuff unless you really really have to but that's fine if you do as well so for example here you press menu we go to the map setup and you can set the topological data obstacle data like how far away ob obstacles show up basically and so on same for land all right and now maps have this range button you twist it and that controls the zoom level of the map so you can zoom in and out okay for the mo's of the group how do we get lat long distance uh, i'm sorry lat long right, okay uh how do we i get the lat long of our current position push the uh, range button all right so i'm gonna go to the map chapter navigation map page and because it's the default I can do that by pressing and holding clear so this is it now you'll notice that this looks a little different than what I showed you before that's because of the overlays I can press map I can now have uh, the terrain this means that I'm within 100 feet of terrain because we're at zero uh, topological is sort of it shows you the elevation of the ground and other stuff as John said if I press the range button remember how i said that this is basically a joystick you get a cursor now i get a cursor and this cursor by default starts where the plane is at the time you pressed it and it tells you you're not long now of course i can move it it's a joystick and it will tell me the latin long and I, uh, it also tells me more things so it tells me like the elevation of the terrain of where that cursor is pointing if i find airspace it will also yeah so see this is kansas city class bravo See, it's highlighting the borders. That's how I know what I'm looking at. Ceiling, 8,000. Floor, 4,000. Really useful information. Okay. Some, some, some later versions of... I, it's not. I guess it's not the 1000. Probably it's something later part as a touchscreen, right? Yeah. So like the G2000, the G3000 has a touchscreen, or the Garmin GTN 650 or 750. So if you fly the 206 that we have in Palo Alto, that has a GTN 650 and that has a touchscreen. So it's a little different, but not that different. Actually, it's a. Uh not quite the same GTN number because uh, the 206 does not have the integrated um, NAVCOM. Right, stuff. it's the 625 to, to be exact, but it's the same thing except for NAVCOM. But, oh, yeah. Just like uh, 6183 Echo doesn't have a Garmin 430, it has a Garmin 400 because it doesn't have a NAVCOM. Okay, MOs, how do we create a user waypoint? You can press enter in the joystick mode. So there, yeah, so you can create a user waypoint if the waypoint that you want is where the cursor is, you can press enter. Gives you a choice. It takes you, well, if it has more than one functions, it will ask you what you want to do. But here, it's only it's basically in the middle of nowhere. So it gave me the only choice that I have, which is create a user waypoint. 
But what if I want to create a waypoint given lat and long? You have to use the FMS knob and go over to, I don't know, I have to see it. Waypoint. Too. Waypoint chapter, user yep. waypoint page. You see the soft key, yep. it says new, press new, you type the name. Okay, if this is my name, what do I have to press to register this name? Enter. Enter. Do not press the knob again. If you press the knob again, your cursor will go away, your changes will go away. That is a mistake you're going to make more times than you would want in the G1000. It's a more, it's a very common mistake. But remember that enter is what enters information into the system. The knob just types them, but enter just registers them. So in this case, I press enter. Now it remembers the name, and now I have the other choices. Now uh, there are different kinds of waypoints. Um, the one we usually use is Latin long. So we define it as a lot long and then I go in and type and I'm not going to do anything fancy here, but here, enter, enter. And now I have a waypoint. Apparently it's over water. Too bad. Oh, oops, sorry. So that happens a lot in a typical mission because the G1000 does not know grid. So if we have to go search a grid, we might have to t program in the four corners. All right, uh, obstacles. If you're within 100 feet, they show up red. We do not subscribe to the obstacle database. So if there's a new cell phone not, uh, radio tower that's in front of you, it might not show up. None of what we're talking about here substitutes pre-flight planning and looking at the window but it's really helpful. All right, and then there's a traffic map page where it always shows you traffic, also great for situation awareness. And just like other navigators, it's a sort of uh, level. So if a traffic shows up in yellow, that means it's assumed to be a threat. And if it shows up a little diamond, it's less of a threat. If it's a diamond that's filled, like a what diamond, it's sort of becoming a threat, but not really a threat yet. It has, so basically it has three levels. And it shows you the relative altitude that you have to the traffic. So zero means that you're in the same altitude. And you also have this line that basically shows where the traffic is going. You can overlay that information on, on the map as well. It's just that the traffic map page shows you only that for decluttering. Storm scope, not for storm penetration, situation awareness. We don't get many thunderstorms around here, so it's less important, but it does show electrical discharges, so that's useful. Uh, and then we have, well, we would normally have XM weather, but that lapsed and it doesn't, it's not yet configured for ADSB weather. So right now it doesn't have any onboard weather, which makes me sad, but normally you would get some sort of uh, weather showing here, and that can also include TFRs, NOTAMs, uh, meters, really cool stuff. One day maybe we'll have them again. What does it depend on at this point? So the G1000 that we have worked great with XM, but since ADSB came, XM is an unnecessary expense, so that, that subscription has lapsed. But the systems have not since been configured to get their weather from ADSB, which is possible. Maybe it's a firmware upgrade, I don't know, or maybe it's just a configuration, but it needs to be done by a Garmin dealer. I don't think it's available to the user, at least I, as far as I know. All right, then we have, uh, let's see. Yeah, you can also get meters and taps for a particular airport. Again, right now you can't, but if you go to the uh, way, the airport information page, you can get all that. You can actually get a lot more here. Let me show you real quick, because this is also something cool. So if I go waypoint, I go to airport information, it's going to show me some airport. I, I, I can change it, but no need. And then it shows you the runways and the frequencies. But if I press weather, it will show me weather if it is reporting weather. This is IFR stuff. And if I press info, this is sort of the page we started with. But there's more info to be had. There's in the second info page. 
with phone numbers and so on. We did not subscribe to this database. We only subscribe to the navigation database. So this information here, like the phone numbers or left traffic pattern altitude, those may, those may be out of date. Okay, All right, so, oops, I went back without sharing again. All right, so, terrain proximity, red means you're within 100 feet or less. Uh, yellow means within 1,000 feet. Remember, pilot 70-1, for sustained flight, we have to be 1,000 feet AGL. So, for no sustained flight or normal flight, you do not want to be flying over yellow. That's what that means. Remember, we don't uh, update the terrain database, at least not often. Uh, it says annually here, but I think it's less than that. And so it's really for a situational aid. Uh, this is the GPS status page. You can check the GPS status. I, I don't want to spend too much time on these little de details that you're going to play around with when you, the time comes. Then you have intersections. You can get the nearest intersection. I, I'm not sure why you would want to do that, but there is a nearest intersection, just like there's nearest everything, ADF, VOR, airport and so on. So you can get a list of those. Uh, and then we talked about the enunciators. Uh, the cautions and warnings give you an audio um, chime, as it's called here. Cautions give you only one. Warnings give you repeated warning tone until you acknowledge the warning. And right, this is some example. Oil pressure is like when the oil pressure is less than 20, low volts, low volts, uh, the, the main um, bus is less than 24. Pitch stream, if that is in up, then vacuum, low fuel, left or right, stamp by battery. So th these are just some examples. Oil pressure, low volts, and stamp by battery come on during the pre-flight. So this stuff we look for. The other stuff, not normally. Although low vacuum, you, you might get, if it, especially if it's a hot day and you're ground all the way idle, you might get a, a low vacuum. And for each of those that you get, or at least for most of those, there is a checklist, the emergency checklist that you should reference and use. So the takeaway message here is if you get an annunciator, find out what's causing it and then follow the appropriate checklist. In this case, the checklist might tell you to cycle the alternator. So you might, you'll keep the battery on, you cycle the alternator, see if it same thing happens or if it changes. If not, this might indicate a alternator failure, so you start shedding loads. But really, follow the checklist. Same standby battery. That enunciator means that the standby battery has is consistently discharging for more than half an hour, for more than 10 seconds, which is abnormal. It should not happen during normal flight. Low vacuum it can indicate low vacuum pump failure, but or as I said, like if you if you idle low, that really only affects the standby attitude indicator. Okay, so in this case, the AirHars attitude and heading reference system failed. You know that by the big big X that's staring right in your face. Can you can anybody tell me if the AirHars that's the only thing that's failed is the airspeed and altitude still accurate? Yes. 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 They're independent units. Now that said, when we practice, we usually practice for both of them failing at the same time, and that's partly because it's you know the wor worst case sort of. But why else do we usually practice for Airhars and ADC both failing at the same time? It's because, for whatever reason, Earhart and ATC are on the same circuit breaker. So if one of them causes it to pop, the other one's going to go down as well. All right, the magnetometer failure. So in this case, and in this case, no, notice that you don't have a heading, because the heading uh, is dependent on both, both the magnetometer and the air hearts. So in these cases, is the GPS CDI needle, is that accurate? Does that work? I would say no. 
I think it's yes. It does work, but it doesn't rotate anymore because it doesn't know the heading. So it's not an HSI anymore, it's an CDI, old style. All right, this is the ADC failing, but in this case, the air heart still works, so you still get attitude and heading and all that. If you lose your comb and navs, this is how they look like. So as you can see, there's a common theme here. If something has failed and the G1000 has detected the failure, it will show you with big, big X's. So it's pretty clear. Now, if you notice some, um, there's some training videos about it. There is sometimes, so if, the, if your air has, is going to fail, the G1000 doesn't necessarily know that right away. So there is a period of time where you might get weird indications. So that's why we tell cross-check, we use standby instruments every now and then, especially if you suspect something is wrong. Like if you get conflicting indications, like your air speed is decreasing where you're the nose is illustrated to be high. So anyway, in this case, it's the integrated avionics unit that failed. Uh, of course, you can have engine indicators failing as well. Uh, if you want to demonstrate these things, do not pull circuit breakers. This is a sketch of the electrical system. So there are two batteries. The main battery powers everything. The essential battery powers only the essential bus. So this bus is really meant for stuff that are helpful to get out of a bad situation if you lose your electrical system. Notice that you have six buses, two mains, two avionics, essential and crossfit. And you don't have to memorize everything, basically what component is on which bus, because the circuit breakers are labeled, thankfully, on the plane. So if you have any sort of situation, you can find out. But as a little quiz, let me ask you, do you have flaps on the essential bus? No. No. No flaps. That, that's why I, I, I like to practice no flap landings. Do you have any sort of lights? No. The only light you have is the standby instrument lights, but otherwise no lights. So you're invisible to other planes, especially at night. Uh, no transponder. Uh, you don't have the MFD that are just stuck with the PFD. You only have COM1 and NAV1, no COM2 and NAV2. Uh, the fuel system, there is a fuel flow meter here. So when you fuel up or when you start, you tell it how much fuel you have and it starts counting down by the fuel flow, that's entirely independent from the fuel gauges. So it's nice to have sort of this redundancy of two things showing you the fuel. Uh, still, we need to do our visual checks. We usually fuel most planes, 182G1000s, at 50 gallons. Uh, there is like filler necks, and we used to use them. The bottom of the filler neck is 64 gallons. Anyway, now we're getting more to the details. Yeah, but yeah, we, we fuel them up to 50. Also notice something interesting here. If there is an abnormal indication, it could be a hot CHD. In this case, it's a low um, essential bus bolt. That will be highlighted either in yellow or red, depending on what it is. So it's meant to grab your attention. If if you have both, in this case, both the left and the right tank, less than nine gallons, you get a caution and you get a yellow highlight in the indicator. If you keep ignoring that, you, they will become red and then now you're suddenly flying a, a glider. Not a very good one either. So you're going to go down. Remember, we, we have to flight plan for one hour of reserve fuel. show you the vacuum gauge, uh, yeah, weather, terrain, traffic, navigation. These are all advisory. Na navigation, of course, we do have the navigation database, so you can fly IFR. What this means is like the airspace. It's advisory only. And then the POH has the kinds of operation equipment list. So if you're wondering, hey, this thing is broken, can I still fly? Well, that list will tell you. Fun fact about our planes. Our strobes are required to be operational 
and sadly they're not LED so every now and then one goes out we have to ground the plane even at broad daylight. Flight into no nice things prohibited. Yeah. Okay so does anybody have any quick questions we can take a, like a three minutes we're a little behind but not too behind we can take three minutes of break and then move on to module two which is a smaller but it's getting into the autopilot stuff. I have a tiny question uh, on the sim in the weather um, thing. I guess it's the map chapter. OK. Do you have the sim there? Oh, oh, I thought you were just going to ask. Yeah, sure. No problem. Weather, weather, weather. It's the I guess it's the map chapter. So the weather data link? Yeah, I was just, does it give you a, a menu of that? I was just curious. Well, it's a setup, uh, but really what we usually do is here, you see the soft keys, these tell you what you're looking at. So I can now enable meters. Yeah, I was curious because you said about changing like between XM and ADSB that I guess, I guess there's different weather providers you can choose among yeah you cannot control it here and that that, that has been the issue uh, normally you would get a weather so this says xm but the weather page i forget in our planes how it's labeled might say xm but if that were to change again that's not user selectable but if yeah. that were to change it wouldn't say xm it would just say weather or maybe it would say adsb i guess we'll see what happens if you had multiple providers, though, that's, I guess, where you would select them, huh? I don't know if you can have multiple at the same time in EG1000. Maybe. I, well, I don't I'm know. Just, I'm looking at the page from Garmin here. It just says, press the menu button, choose the weather provider. Just curious. OK. OK. Well, that's that's good to know. Um, make sure, you know, there's, there's the G1000 NXI as well, the next generation. Mm. Which is not the one we have. The our 182s are not. The 172 has the NXI. Ah, okay. And there are small differences. I, I don't know. This may be one of them. Uh, it also changes with the exact plane. So, like, if you fly G1000 in a series, it is it is a little different. And you see that when it starts, like when it boots, it tells you what what system it, config you have. It, or it tells you the yes, the make and model, and it's actually in the pre-flight checklist to make sure that it's the correct. That's the right model. one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You don't fly a yeah a series G one thousand. Okay, so if everybody's back, or I guess I have just one, most of you, uh, yes. A side question: uh, Our aircraft all have ABSB, correct? Since we're in the yeah yeah yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all of them do. The the roundels included. Uh, okay, so first I need to start the presentation. So as I said, module two is about the autopilot and the flight director. Now there are two autopilots that we have in CAP. It's the CAP 140. Notice it's a K, not not a C. So it's it's a CAP 140 autopilot, and I think there's like two or three planes in California that have this, but none of them are in group two. So we usually skip this there are some differences the most important visual difference is that you'll see that it's a separate module it's not integrated into the g1000 it's a separate module for an autopilot and there there are differences about how you climb a descent but they're not that important uh, i mean okay they are important but they're not that substantial so if you do get to fly one of those planes please get some precision training or read out about it but for those reasons, yeah, we usually don't, and, and you know, it's been, I've only flown that in CP once and it was like six years ago or something. So uh, it's kind of hard to find one in CAP. Now this autopilot does exist in other planes before, so maybe you've flown it outside of CAP, I don't know, but anyway. A little older the pilot, but still a good one. The one we have is the GFC 700 and it's nicely integrated and you, you'll see these, the buttons that control it, they're part of the PFD and the MFD, they're on the left side. 
And that system has a flight director and an autopilot. Very important concept. What is the difference between a flight director and an autopilot? Anybody? The flight director issues the commands to the autopilot, which issues the control movements to the servos. Yes. Now, the flight director issues the commands to the autopilot. That, that's correct, but it doesn't have to command the autopilot. It can also show you what you should be doing as the pilot. Basically, flight director is the brains. The autopilot is just the muscles. It is, it is told what to do. It's not smart otherwise. So this is what we're going to talk about, the anatomy of the autopilot system and so on. And, and this, these are the buttons in more detail. Again, on the left side of the PFT and the MFT. The most important button when it comes to autopilot is the AP button. It engages the autopilot, also disengages it. FD, FD, flight director, engages the flight director. So you can have the flight director on with the autopilot off, but not vice versa. And the other buttons, all the other buttons below, change the mode of the flight director. So the heading button will take you in and out of the heading mode. Altitude, in and out of the altitude hold mode. Nav, now we're going, uh, so, so that has to do with the following uh, GPS flight plan, if you're in GPS, if the CDI needles on GPS, or keep the needles straight if you're flying a VOR. I, I, I will demo that, with that. Well, it's I think, more easily understandable in the simulator. Vertical nav is basically the vertical path, so you can draw from A to B, you can tell it what altitudes you want to be at, each of those waypoints, and it will calculate the rate of descent. It's pretty handy. Approach and BC, they're for IFR, that's for another day. And then vertical speed and flight level change um, are how we change altitudes. Those two, actually for all of them, what you need to know for all of these modes is that each of them has a goal. It tries to keep something constant. So the heading mode keeps the heading constant. Altitude mode keeps the altitude constant. Nav mode keeps the needle centered. They all have something that they keep constant. Vertical speed keeps a constant vertical speed. Flight level change, the name is a little confusing, but flight level change keeps airspeed constant. And then nose up or down change what airspeed or vertical speed we're climbing or descending at. Okay, I think everybody should know this if you've done all these trainings before. If we want to climb, do we climb vertical speed, flight level change, and why? Flight level change to climb. Flight change. Why? So you don't stall. How would you stall? As a vertical speed, you tell it, you give it a speed that it has to try to, uh, a rate that it has to try to keep, and that rate could exceed your stall speed. Whereas flight level change, you you uh, you were telling it to get to a certain uh, uh, altitude, and it's not dependent on the speed. So in both cases, they're going to go to a certain altitude. So the altitude bag works the same. We'll talk about that. But other than that, you're exactly right. So what's going to happen is say that I want to climb to by 2,000 feet. If I say I want to climb at 500 feet per minute, I press vertical speed and then press nose up until it says 500 feet per minute. Great. The plane is going to try its best to maintain 500 feet per minute climb. If I don't give it throttle, it will keep trying its best until the plane may or may not, depending on the parameters, stall. If I do the same thing on flight level change, if I ask it to climb at, say, 85, 90 knots, and I don't give it power, it might not climb, but it will maintain uh, the airspeed that I told it, and therefore it will not stall. Okay. Now, you'll see on the top of the PFT, the different modes of the flight director. So as you see here, is the autopilot engaged? Yes. Yes. Your one and only way of knowing is that green AP. And that is really what you should be looking at. There should be one person between the pilot and the autopilot flying the plane, exactly one, not zero, not two. 
and the pilot knows if the autopilot is on by looking at that, at that AP. Now, next to AP, there's different modes. The modes that have to do with bank are to the left of AP. The modes that have to do with pitch are to the right of AP. The active mode is in green. What active is basically the mode that's controlling what the flight director is doing. The white modes are modes that are armed, but they're not active, meaning they're not actually telling the flight director what to do, but they're armed, they're waiting for something, for some condition to come through, and then they'll become active, and then they'll start telling the flight director what to do. Notice a basic element of the flight director, the magenta command bars. So based on the modes, this is what the flight director has determined the plane should be doing. So if, if the plane should bank to the left, these magenta bars will show a bank to the left or pitch up or down likewise. So in this case, we're flying a GPS, meaning we're flying the CDI needle GPS, flying a flight plan essentially. Uh, the localizer mode is standing by, it's armed, I mean. Now we have altitude hold, we're maintaining 3,300 feet. See that here, and uh, the glide slope, that's what GS, this is IFR stuff, but anyway, this, there's another mode, glide slope in this case, that's armed. Yeah, so these magenta bars are the wedge bars, and uh, if the autopilot is on, and, and that's why we said the autopilot is just the muscle. All the autopilot does is it puts the yellow, which is what the plane is actually doing, to touch the magenta, which is what the plane should be doing. They should be doing is generated by the flight director. The is doing, actually making that happen, is the autopilot. But if you're flying a flight director without the autopilot on, it's your job to put the yellow next to the magenta. Autopilot is the muscle. OK, yeah, so if you press only the FTK, you get only the flight director. You get flying wedge cues depending on, on what you select. I'm going to demonstrate some of these things, so we don't need to go through the text. But uh, all right, so let's say that the flight, direct, flight director is off and you press the AP button. That engages the autopilot, but you cannot have the autopilot without the flight director on. So that will also give you a flight director. What is the mode that the flight director is on right when you, you press the autopilot? What's the first modes, two modes? Uh, roll and roll and pitch roll hold. and pitch hold pitch exactly so roll defaults by saying I want to keep a zero bank and pitch defaults saying I want to keep a zero pitch all right and then it you can keeps whatever pitch it had when you push the button doesn't it uh you may be right I thought I, I think I that's right. Okay, yeah. What I was going to lead to that, there's, you can change both the bank and the pitch later as well with the uh, the control wheel string button, but but we're coming to that. Okay. So part of the pre-flight checklist is also that you have to overpilot the autopilot, you have to disengage, you have to see uh, that you can disengage the autopilot. This is the left hand yoke. You see there's the push to talk button, control wheel string button, easily confusable, but they do very different things. The red button here is the autopilot dis disconnect. If you disengage the autopilot, you will get a flashing red, um, excuse me, flashing yellow with a chime, actually three or four chimes, and that will tell you that it, it's basically meant to tell you, make sure that you know that the autopilot has is disengaged. Has anybody seen a flashing red on the autopilot? No, thankfully. What does that mean? Is flashing that red means altitude? that there is an error that's been detected in the autopilot and it's been disabled. It means that the autopilot disconnected itself. For some reason, yes, there's some error. Who, uh, who knows what the reason is? But the point is the autopilot disconnected itself. 
And in that case, you'll get a red flash and you will get a chime, but it will chime for longer. It really wants to make sure that, that you know that. And actually the chime is important. Uh, the, uh, the POH section two limitations, there's a page on the GFC 700 limitations. So basically when you can use the autopilot. One of those limitations is that to use the autopilot, the audio needs to be operational and, and the speaker. So basically you need to be able to hear the chime. OK, so this is going to a little bit more of technique. So you, you can use the heading knob to set the heading back to the runaway heading and then the uh, altitude bug to set the first level of altitude and you can even pre-select the flight director. But what is the minimum altitude that you can fly, uh, engage the autopilot at after takeoff? Is it 800? 800. 800, yep. Except for instrument approaches, but yes, otherwise it's 800. Because they want you to have some altitude in case something, you know, the, the autopilot does something crazy. You should have some altitude to recover. So this is wrong pitch. The flight director is on, the autopilot is not. So this now we're flying with only the flight director. Question? Yes. Um, does that 800 uh, apply to missed approaches? Yeah, so missed approaches are part of an instrument procedure. So, but there's another limitation that uh, when you're doing a missed approach, you cannot re-engage the autopilot until you establish a climb. So how it works, and this does change in other planes, other flavors than G1000, but for our planes, how it works is if you decide to go miss, you press the go around button, that disengages the autopilot. You establish a climb manually, you can set the flight director, and then you can re-engage the autopilot. But you don't have to wait for 800 feet if you're part doing the mist. OK, so since I mentioned that, how many ways are there to disengage the autopilot? Well, there's a trim See? switch, I think. And there's a disconnect switch on the yoke. And there's the auto AP button. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've got them all. And the circuit breaker. Oh, yeah. no control button. wheel steering. Control wheel steering does not disengage it. It only disconnects it temporarily. We'll talk about that. The go around uh, button. The go around button disengages. Basically, everything else we talked about will disengage it. The uh, circuit breaker will turn it off. That circuit breaker is the only one that has a white ring around it, so it's nicely labeled. And also, it's it's part because the the autopilot also controls the uh, the trim. If you try to use the electrical trim, it will disengage. But also, that breaker is important because if you have a runaway trim situation, the checklist calls out to pull that breaker. Not as the first step, but. As you go down the checklist, the calls, and that's actually a new item in the new form five is to, to to demonstrate that. You pull the autopilot breaker. Is that what Schmidt said? Yeah, because the the autopilot breaker also is the electrical trim. So if you pull the autopilot breaker, you also disable the electrical trim, which is a good thing if you have a runaway trim. Yeah, I've been wondering about that ever since the uh, 737 Max fiasco. Yeah. Yeah, we, we we can disengage it here. <laughs> uh, okay, All right. And then I, I actually part of part of your form five is also to demonstrate that it's a mandatory item. What happens in a runaway trim situation? And the first thing the checklist says is firm grasp of the yoke. So basically, don't let the pl the plane climb or descend, whatever it wants to do. You'll notice that you actually have to push hard. It it really it you have to exert force. And then do the rest of the items, which is Press the disconnect button, uh, change the stream, and then the breaker, if I remember right. OK, so this basically says what we talked about before. If you want to climb or descent, uh, adjust power. We talked about why on the climb, but even on the descent is useful, because if you want to descend and you maintain cruise power, that's going to be a pretty exciting descent. And you might reach the yellow arc actually 
uh, you typically do. But both vertical speed and flight level change have a goal. The goal is displayed here, right in front of you. You can change the speed or the vertical speed by the nose up and down buttons. Uh, so let's see, stuff we talked about before. Yeah, stuff we talked about before. I'll, I'll demonstrate how flight level change and vertical speed work. So you don't need to read or memorize all, all that. And I also will demonstrate what happens if you're in nav mode and you press the CDI button. OK, control wheel string button. What does it do? Anybody? Temporarily, Temporarily disengages the autopilot. As long as it's pushed. Yeah, so it's a, it says disengage here. It's more of a disconnect because disengage with, for the autopilots, I mean, for I'm sorry, what we talked about before disengage is the autopilot sort of basically stops working. It's sort of uh, you turn it off here. You basically disconnect the servos from the control surfaces. So the autopilot is still working, still trying to do what it wants to do, but it gets disconnected. And in fact, if you're on the ground, you press the control wheel steering button, you can actually hear the the mechanical parts moving. To, to make the disconnect happen. It's like a tank. If you press, yeah. No, I was going to say that it also makes it uh, easier to overpower the, the autopilot if you press the button as opposed to trying to do it manually. Of course, yes, yes. Because the autopilot is no longer on, on exerting any forces on the control surfaces. It's, it's trying but it's disconnected from the control forces. And does that stop the autopilot from changing the trim? That's a good question. I believe not. It's a good question, though. Uh, it, may, it may depend on the airplane. I know in some airplanes it, it does disable the, uh, the trim control. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I, I haven't really thought of it because control wheel steering is really meant to be a temporary thing. It's like you want to avoid traffic, you want to avoid something else, or you're in roll mode and you don't want to be in roll mode with zero bank, you want to be in roll mode with 20 bank. Something else that control wheel steering button does is it changes the goal of roll and pitch and altitude hold. So say that you're in roll mode at zero bank, press control wheel steering, control wheel steering, hold it, establish the 20 degree bank yourself and let go of the control wheel steering button. It will maintain that bank. Okay, this is here. So when you disengage the autopilot, you can disengage the flight director, but you don't have to. Um, I, I, I usually suggest if you're not going to uh, use the flight director, disengage it as well. But if you're going to use it, leave it on. Basically, you don't want to have something st right in your face that you're not using. It might become confusing. Okay, the go around. When you do, this is more relevant for IFR, but you can use it for VFR as well. When you press the go around button, that takes both pitch and bank to the go around mode. And the go around mode is seven and a half degrees pitch up straight ahead. OK, so I'll do some demos. Oh, wait, no, yeah, that, that's it. I'll do some demos of what we just talked about because it's a lot of, you know, talking. But does anybody have any questions until I find out? Yeah. OK, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, does the uh, does R172 have a go around button? Because I've never seen it. I'm pretty sure it does, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it does. All right. OK, so this is the PFD. I'm on CDI. Let's go back to GPS for a little while. All right, so I'm going to establish some throttle here in the trainer. And I thought that was control forward, but now I'm doubting it. OK, why is it? Why is this plane not starting? Uh, we're not paused, are we? No, we're not paused. Can't you do it by menu, menu? Yeah, just use keyboard for joystick. There it is. Uh, 
Par parking brake, George. Yeah, right. I was going to say wheel chocks. OK, yes, I will do it by menu menu because something's going on here. Do you want to go to 100 knots today? Let's see. Uh, OK, this 90, sure, why not? So we're going to go at 90 knots. And right now we're uh, trimming the trees because we're on the ground. So, but that's fine for now. Let's say the first thing I want to do is climb. I feel pretty, I feel pretty motivated to climb right now. So when I press the autopilot button, notice that as we said, we're going to go to roll and pitch. The autopilot is on. I know that because it's here. The out you select mode is the armed and it will become active when our altitude becomes equal to the altitude bug. I'll demonstrate that. Now, if you buy the Garmin trainer, there are a bunch of versions. Each version has different bugs. My version has the bug that the flight level change button doesn't work. That's version 12. If you want different bugs, buy 13. Uh, so I'm going to have to climb with vertical speed, which is what I know what we said we shouldn't do, but this little toy will not climb otherwise. So I'm going to say vertical speed and I'm going to say nose up 500 feet and notice that the flight director is pointing up and the autopilot is following it. So now we're climbing. I'm in roll mode. If I press heading, I'll go in heading mode and that's going to make the plane go turn and match the heading back. So that's how that looks like. Now I'm in heading mode. And now I'm turning to find the heading bug. By the way, this is a PFT with synthetic vision, which we do not have. So all you're going to see in CFP is going to be blue and brown. And there's an obstacle ahead. I hope we clear it. All right, so now we're climbing. We're following the heading bug. Let me go to my waypoint again. So notice that I am direct to this KF. This is the distance. This is the bearing. But I've deviated. So let me reset that. I'm going to go direct again. R turn right to 032. But it's not actually going to do it because I'm in heading mode. If I want to, well, if I want the flight director to follow that, I'm going to press nav mode. And now I'm on GPS. And GPS just keeps the needle center. And in this case, the needle is pointing straight towards that waypoint because that's what I've dialed in. Okay, how high is the terrain over here? We're still on it. Uh, anyways, okay, so. Here in Kansas, it's flat. <laughs> yeah, right, but anyway. What's going to happen if, if I press the CDI button? Mm, it's going to show you a green arrow pointing to what nav one is, but since nav one isn't doesn't seem to be identified, it's just going to have a, a dead arrow basically pointing up. Yeah, so that's going to happen to <laughs> my HSI. That's correct. What about my flight director mode? I think it goes to roll, right? I, I don't know if you heard that. There was a that one. You see the altitude back flashing. That's the, the 1000 foot warning. And now we're off the ground. But you're right, yes, it does go to roll, but it's. OK, we, we also have terrain warning in this plane. I, enjoy this because we, we don't get this in, in CAP. OK, so if I press the CDI button, it will go into roll mode. That's correct, but it will be annoyed it, because it's it's not really good practice. So it will flash yellow. So notice what happens here. Press CDI. GPS flashes yellow. It's similar to the autopilot. It's basically saying GPS disconnected. Okay, how do I disable sounds? There we go. Okay, so yeah, it's going back to roll mode. And then if uh, what I can do is I can find the uh, VOR and show you how that works well actually first we're gonna level off because we're getting close and i can speed it up a little uh the simulator doesn't understand physics by the way so even if you climb harder it will maintain airspeed 
So what you're going to notice is that the altitude select mode, now it's in white, it's armed, it's waiting. When that's a 200 feet warning, it's flashing. When we get close enough, this is going to become a flashing green, means now altitude select will be active because the altitude is going to match the altitude bag. See, now it's active. So now we're in hold mode for altitude. Now it's maintaining 2000 feet. If I didn't have an altitude bag set, or if I had an altitude bag set below, it would never stop climbing. Okay, let me also demonstrate. Oh, I said Romo. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll go to MFT. We'll go to our nearest VOR because I want to find a frequency. I don't, we're somewhere in Kansas. I don't know the VORs there. And let's see, news. VOR, Kansas City MO, what's it? 113.25. I have different options to tune it. I can get a cursor, scroll down, uh, wait, or enter. I guess I do have to scroll down. Yeah, select frequency window. There's a better way to do this, but anyway. Enter. So now I put 113.25. That's going to be by VOR, go back to PFT. Now I'm going to tune in that frequency to be active in that one. I do that with flip-flop switch. Now it's active. It will listen to the Morse code and identify it for you. Really handy. And this is the needle. Now I can twist the needle. Oops, that's the barometric setting. Yeah, see, it's easy to make a mistake. Okay, so I can twist the needle, just like a CTI. And I can keep twisting it until the needle centers. So it centers here with a setting of 0, 3, 6. Is that to or from? Well, but both of the uh, arrows are pointing the same direction, so I think it's, it's two. two. That's right, it's two. So if I press nav here, goes to VOR mode, it's going to point towards the VOR. It All it's going to try to do here is it's going to try to maintain the needle center. If it flies over the VOR, it will fly from the VOR, but as long as the needle center, the needle remains centered, it will be happy. And the thing also, yeah, I was talking about the, the trend bar with the turn. So I'm going to make it turn left degree, uh, left about 90 degrees. Heading mode, it's going to go to the heading bag. Notice the trend bar. If that trend bar touches that big white line as it does right now, that's a standard rate turn right now. Okay, so unfortunately, I, I don't have a control wheel steering button here, so I cannot demonstrate that. I can show you a descent, but that's you know, almost the same thing. So we basically set the altitude bug, let's say 1500 feet, gonna go vertical speed. Notice when I press it, it's at zero. So no nothing's gonna change right away, assuming I don't change the power, but I can say nose down. Now we're going down by 500 feet and the same thing is gonna happen. When the altitude reaches the altitude bug, altitude select, which is altitude hold, will become active and it will flash green. George, this might be helpful to set a pattern altitude on descent. So Maybe, yeah, that's if that works for you, that's great. You can use the altitude bug for the pattern altitude of the airport you're flying to. Absolutely. It's a really helpful reminder, even if you don't use it for the flight director, it's it's a reminder it, like you can use it to remember the altitude that you were given. All right, so now it's I'll speed up. Just a little note, as, as George goes through this, something to, to get in a habit on is practice your scanning, okay? You don't have to be an IFR pilot to practice your scanning. So Are notice now that it's active, yeah. flashing green, 1,500 feet. Okay, I, I, I think that's plenty for tonight. Uh, there's a lot more to this system that you're going to have to slowly pick up on. If you're transitioning from rod dials, the POH is a great read. 
Some stuff are more complicated, stuff some are exactly the same. Get this trainer, really helpful, the reference manual, online training, all great stuff. I'll stay here for any more questions. I think we're done with the material. Thanks, George. Appreciate it. Thank Good you. night, everybody. I guess we can stop the recording since there are no questions. Okay.